Mig Zizo Novel Productions presents How I Became a Mermaid, an original story written and conceived by author Mig Zizo, aka Miget Isaac. Edited by Maria Kirin. Animated subtitles by Joshua Noble. Original soundtracks composed by Mig Zizo. Recorded by Elijah Kay and Solomon Willow. Narrated by Jeff Martin. And powered by God Most High. And now, how I became a mermaid. I had three best friends, James, Paul, and Dave. They were all married men, actually we were all married men. All of them had children, except me. The problem wasn't with my wife, but me. I was barren. She was so faithful to me, she bore with bareness, praying hard that one time, we will have a child of our own. But later on, her streak of being faithful was broken. At the very beginning of the first week of June, the year 1952, James caught his wife red-handed with another man, doing what, of course making love. As that wasn't enough, in the very same week, the day being Tuesday, it was Paul who got his wife right in the act. Unbelievable, yet true, Dave stumbled upon his wife with another man kissing in the town park. All my best friend's wives had cheated on them, so disappointed they were. They had always made a big deal out of my barrenness, laughing at me almost each and every minute that we had our boys meeting at the boys end, but this time round, the tables had been turned against them. I couldn't help it but laugh at them so hard that my lungs started even hurting. And I very knew it was mean to laugh at the misfortunes of the others, but these guys left me no option, also remember they had always laughed at my infertility, so I think tit for tart was a fair game. Anyways, after I gave them some comforting speeches, I drove back home that night. The house was eerily silent, made me somewhat suspicious. Anyways, I didn't mind the silence so much, I just made it up the stairs, sneaking like a cat would do, my goal being to spook my wife, a habit I always practiced once I entered the house. I slowly and quietly checked everywhere, but couldn't find her. There's one room I hadn't checked, the basement, maybe she was down there doing some dusting. I slowly, silently creaked the door down there to the basement, and what I opened my eyes to was my wife busy with some other guy. I slowly backpedaled, good enough they didn't see me, so I moved out of there in total disbelief, a disbelief which seconds later turned into serious anger. And the result of that anger, was me rushing to the trunk of the car, madly pulled out a fuel can, and poured it around the whole house. After I finished, I summoned my lighter from my pockets, and lit it up, but nothing. Lit it up once more, nothing. I looked for a matchbox everywhere, but I couldn't get one. And it was at that very time that I heard a voice speak to me, saying, don't do it, just walk away, remember, two wrongs don't equal to good. Those words tore off the cloak of rage that had wrapped itself around my heart. I changed my mind, and did as the voice said to me. I drove away still the same night, and went back to the boy's end. I haven't told you this, but Boy's End was a house that me and those three best friends of mine had built ourselves as an escape place whenever maybe we had quarreled with our wives. And it didn't surprise me in the least of bits when I found the boys already there. They were still hurting from having found their wives cheating on them. What they didn't know that also me, things hadn't gone well. They say birds of the same feathers stick together, and I know I've done a little change in that saying, but that's not the point of the story. The thing is that we had all been cheated on, and here we were in our boys' end bungalow, consoling ourselves. After what was about one to two hours of yammering here and there, there and here, talking this and that, that and this, Dave came up with an idea, an idea that we all welcomed so well. What was it? It was for us to have a time off all alone on Silent Island, in Mermaid Ocean. Why was it called Mermaid Ocean? It was because many people who had ventured the beautiful ocean, always claimed that they had glanced at the most beautiful and astounding creatures of ocean, I'm talking of the mermaids. And why was Silent Island called so? Because there was no living soul that was inhabiting it, not even birds and insects. There were only trees of which most were palms. So that's where we were planning to sail to, the next morning. And so that night, we watched a certain drama series as best friends, and that's when sleep had us under arrest. It didn't take eternity, the night had ended, and morning had come. 
We did all the preparations, grabbed our trailer truck, rented out a boat, and off we drove the four of us to the coast where Mermaid Ocean was found, without telling anyone where we had gone, especially not our cheating wives. Listen, the reason as to why we had started our journey in the morning, was because Mermaid Ocean was pretty far. We were supposed to reach there at around 4 p.m. exactly in the evening, and then rush to the ocean, after then, sail to Silent Island and camp there. But then, we got a flat tire, and not only that but also got some issues with the police. So by the time it got to 8 p.m., we were still left with a four hours distance to cover. There's no way we were ever going to continue on with the journey, actually we were even so tired having been driving the whole day, and all the long process that the goddamn police had us go through. So with that said, we had to make a stop, and sleep in the trailer truck. That night passed, and the next morning we resumed, driving the remaining four hours, and there we were, on the track that led to Mermaid Ocean. Once we reached the sandy shores, we had the boat pushed into the ocean. But before we could go, the coast police called them the coast guards, asked us to sail to all other islands and places, but not to Silent Island. We didn't even bother to ask them why, but we just lied to them, that we weren't even having it as the tiniest of ideas to sail to Silent Island. So with that lie, we got into the boat, and sailed off leaving them as they diminished behind us, until a moment when we could see them no more. We then turned our helm, the boat steering, and changed course, leading to Silent Island, knowing little that this was a mistake we were ever going to regret in life that's if we ever survive. Anyways, we sailed to the island, which was also quite far, and as we were half the distance, the time being around 5 p.m., something happened to knock up the back part of our boat. The back end rose high up in the air, before again descending back with a slap-like sound. What the hell was that, we asked ourselves, and the response we had available for us was the front part also to be knocked up from below, and also high up it flew, and we clutched on anything we could that we may not descend down as the many other things of ours had gone, needful to say, the extra cans of fuel we had carried with us. But then the boat assumed the horizontal position again. What the hell was that, a shark or something, petrified Dave asked. We should have listened to the coast guards, we shouldn't have sailed to these ends, now look what we've gotten ourselves into. That was Paul regretting. And while all that happened, I happened to see a giant snake-like movement in the water. Whatever was making that wavy movement was wiggling away from our boat. We hadn't seen what it was, but the way its wavy movement churned up the ocean, just created the most horrid picture of what the real thing looked like. We were paralyzed with fear, is the sentence I can use to describe how scary the situation we were in was. Now knowing how dire the situation was, and seeing whatever that thing was, as it wiggled away from us in a giant wave-like movement, we fired up the engine as fast as it could go, but then, unfortunately after a while, the fuel tank went dry and we very well knew that the extra cans had been lost to the ocean, when the aquatic entity was trying to knock us over. I won't lie to you, but our eyes grew extra wide, as we heard the engine's chug grow ever so silent and silent and silent, until there was no sound coming from it, a dark fact that implied to zero motion for our boat, which zero motion meant no progress, which no progress equaled to us being stuck in the middle of Mermaid Ocean, as the sun sunk down, permitting darkness to cover the sea, and only the pale light of the moon to fight it. I swear by this time, not a single one of the four of us was still brave enough to even utter a single word. The fear, ever so indescribable, had rendered us all speechless. It was us all alone in the middle of the ocean, at night. We didn't tell anyone where we were going to, and we didn't expect any boat or ship to come sailing by that we may be rescued. And to make matters worse, our phones had also dropped into the ocean during the traumatic moment when the thing was toying with our boat. However much we stretched our eyes, we couldn't see any shore, not an island up close, totally nothing. In simple terms, it was water here and there, there and here. Now while we were all there so confused, we happened to see a giant wave-like movement making its way towards us. There was no doubt that the aquatic monster, whose appearance we hadn't seen as yet, had struck again. Watch this, even though we very well knew that the engine had run out of fuel, we still fidgeted to fire it up, and this is exactly where we understood the saying that a drowning man will hold on to a straw. 
Indeed, they say that desperate times call for desperate measures, but really, for us, we didn't even have the desperate measures. We just had to watch as the thing this time round tore our boat apart. Thanks for the life jackets we had on us, we managed to stay afloat. There was a calm after the storm of destruction that the aquatic monster had caused to us, and that was just a two minutes of us floating about like the broken pieces of what was our boat. Let me tell you this. There's nothing that can be equal to the mind-warping fright of floating in the middle of the ocean at night surely knowing that something is lurking under there just below you. It was Dave first to be pulled down, and what came up in the wake of his disappearance was a giant bubbling of blood. When we saw what had happened to Dave, we didn't need to be told twice to start madly swimming away from the trouble hotspot. But the question is where were we really frantically swimming to? Like I had said, it was water here and there, there and here. Now as me, James and Paul, were swimming just for the sake of saving our lives, they were at a terrific speed, snatched down into the ocean by something which was large crab-like arms. And just like Dave, in the wake of James and Paul's snatching, giant bubbles of thick blood floated back up to the ocean's surface. I was now all left alone, my eyes open as wide as they had never been before, my arms flapping in the water, like a penguin's, but still, I had something grab hold of both of my feet, and down I was snatched as well. This time round I got a chance of seeing the full appearance of the aquatic monster that had given us a hell of five minutes, the five minutes in which I had lost three of my best friends. The head was that of an octopus, only that this one was the size of a bungalow house, and there were eight sets of eyes, four in front, four behind. Its hellish mouth was a base of a thousand canines, and what was supposed to be its abdomen, was countless sets of very long, strong, giant tentacles that ended in crab-like arms. Now that giant crab octopus aquatic monster had both of my feet clamped in one of its countless crab-like arms, and was dragging me to who knows where, the deepest parts of the ocean, or something. That thing couldn't have let me go if it wasn't for the blood of my buddies that it had slaughtered before, which brought in a company of sharks. The sharks really occupied it that it had to let me go free, even though it had really hurt my feet so bad, and worst of all, had signed a big cut into my belly. I struggled to swim up to the ocean surface, leaving behind the monster thing busy tearing the sharks into a thousand pieces. Look, the sharks were no match for this thing, but at least they kept it busy, and in fact, diverted it away from me. I had just survived a horrible death, even though I was bleeding like crazy from my feet and belly. I managed to get onto a big chunk of what was left of our boat, and thanks be to God, the wind slowly blew me until where there was a very small island, an island which was the size of a family car. I paddled the water with my arms and got to that tiny island, I just wanted to get out of the monster's waters, lest it find me still dilly-dallying from there, and again give me hell. There I was on that small island, blood profusely flowing out of me. It didn't take longer than five minutes, I started feeling like death was near, blood enough had run out of me, I passed out. It was just a miracle that after a while, I opened my eyes again. I was expecting to see the heavenly realms, but it was the ocean I was still seeing. But wait a minute, there was something on which my head was lying. The rest of it was dipped in water, and the other part was what I had my head laid on. Whatever it was, it was kinda scaly, yet smooth. It was more like the body of a fish, only that this was somewhat bigger, indeed big. I turned my head to this other side that I wasn't looking at, and what I found there was a female face looking straight into my eyes. I swear this was the most beautiful face of a girl I had ever set my eyes on. The wet reddish-brown hair cascading from her head all the way up to her back was just so hypnotizing, ever so charming. Her appearance from the head to her waist was so enticing, and that made me fall in love right away, the love that's mostly referred to as love at first sight. She was the sexiest female creature I had ever set my eyes on, I was just one call away from death, but then I felt like death had to wait a little bit more, if not just giving me one chance more. Her body from the head to the waist was human, but then ended up in a large fish body. That's when I realized I had been found by a mermaid. I had always heard sailors that had ever sailed mermaid ocean, claiming that they had encountered mermaids, but then I had been found by one. Honestly, she was so beautiful. And I must say here that mermaids are way much gorgeous than humans. 
Anyways, that mermaid had laid me on its fish body, and had cleaned my wounds, even though still my death was unstoppable, enough blood had gone out of me. What's your name, handsome sailor, she asked me. It was the first time that I heard her voice, and it sounded so special, so unique. I can better describe it as a mixture of a six-year-old girl's voice, and that of a sexy tone of an 18-year-old girl. I'm, I'm, called Christian, that was me speaking like someone just about to die. Then she was like, Sailor Christian, you're about to die, and there's nothing I can do for you to stop the bleeding, unless I turn you into one of us, a mermaid. See this, even though I was weak from bleeding, my ears were still working ever so properly, I had heard what she had said to me. I was in a fix. If I accepted, that meant to spend all my life as a mermaid in the deep blue ocean. If I refused this offer, I was going to die. I looked back home, and what had I left there for me, nothing, but a cheating wife. So better I accept the favor and go spend the rest of my life with this beauteous mermaid. Therefore I accepted, and I was like, how can, you, turn one, into a mermaid? When I had just said that, she replied, like this, as she bent her angelic face towards mine, to find my mouth, and there she gave me this kind of life-giving, kiss. If I say that I've ever forgotten that kiss, then I will be the worst of liars. After that sweet kiss under the moonlit night on that teeny island, I felt an energy new unfold within me, my wounds started sewing themselves together until they were no more. My legs got stuck together until they became one big piece, and a cloud of mist covered it, and as it cleared, a scaly smooth body of a fish appeared starting from my waist up to down. I had transformed into a mermaid, and my eyes had become as green as hers. I was strong again, and was never dying any sooner. When I looked at myself, and so the new creature I was, and how I had just survived death, I hugged her thanking her so much with my now mermaid heart, and as my mermaid tail flapped for joy in the ocean waters. I asked her her name, and she said she was called Mermaidron. Now that was some beautiful name. She then said, I can't wait to present you to my parents and friends. Then she took me down into the waters. The end. This story has a second part to it called, Massacre in Mermaid World. Another original story from Migs Izo Novel Productions, written and conceived by Migs Izo. Edited by Maria Kirin. Migs Izo has written a plethora of short stories and series, and just to mention but a few. Linda McCain's Disappearance, The Mysterious Box, Death is Hunting My Girlfriend, Spying on Death, Is It a Ghost or an Angel, The Strange Deaths, The Strange Mark on My Head, The Ghost Village, The Portal to Darkness, Murder Revenge and the Grim Reaper, The Creepy Eight-Year-Old Girl, A Dark Night in the Manhole, Somebody is Killing Me, How I Became a Mermaid, Cloned by Evil, Midnight at the Cemetery, and so many more. You can reach him at migadisaac at gmail.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe.